thank you all of you for being here. Thank you for Habib University and for organizing this event and inviting me. My journey that brought me to Aal Khan University almost nine years ago, where I've been faculty and that indeed has brought me to this stage and to talk to you today, is that of one of a researcher and a scientist. And from the images that are playing behind me, many of you would not be wrong to think that perhaps I work on some sort of exotic marine life. Or perhaps uh, these images themselves are somehow digitally generated. In fact, they're not. These somewhat hauntingly beautiful, but very, very real images are the centerpiece of my talk today, and they are cancer. We're going to be talking about the big C. What are, and I'm going to pepper my talk throughout today about many C's, many big C's, many little C's. The first one stands for cancer. And it's common. One in three of us, actually it's one in two, a half, two and a half of us, you guys do the math on that, will get cancer in our lives. One in five, probably more than that, is going to die of it. My previous speaker set this up, Nida talked about it being the second leading, leading cause of death in the world. And it's, it's common because it's extremely clever and creative in the way that it hijacks normal physiologic processes and respo or stops responding to signals that normally tell cells to stop growing and becomes literally the enemy within. And it's extremely complex because the systems that take us from a single cell organism and then a dual cell organism and brings us to being a fun fully functioning human being are extremely complex. So when cancer hijacks that system, it becomes a very, very complex, very heterogeneous disease. So the second C, the second big C that I'm going to talk about, is the conspiracy theories. And these conspiracy theories that you hear about, the most common one these days in social media, that it's not a disease at all. In fact, it's just a vitamin B deficiency. Well, you talk to the people who get cancer. One very dear friend of mine is here today. Ask her. It's a disease. She felt it. And there's no magic bullet and no magic cure. I love how people will go on smoking, which causes 33% of cancers, but will then complain or, or spread rumors about that lipstick that's going to cause cancer. So these conspiracy theories then trivialize what is already a complex disease, and they bring confusion and division amongst us. So that brings me, um, and I'm going to date myself to this conspiracy theory reference, that the truth is out there. And for those of you who re remember this, this is from the X-Files. The truth is out there, and there's many of us who are seeking the truth. We're trying to find out why cancer happens in the first place. Can we prevent it? Um, and once it's there, what is the best way to treat it? And by that, I mean there are thousands and hundreds of thousands of people who are looking into this. And we're generating massive data, big data, across the world. When I did a search on PubMed, which is a, a database uh, for medical webs uh, or medical journals this morning, and I typed in the word cancer, 3,458,191 articles. A quarter of those million, or a million of those are just in the past five years alone. There's a lot of information out there. And earlier last month, I had the privilege of listening to former Vice President of the United States, Joe Biden, talk about his Cancer Moonshot initiative. And shortly thereafter, I was at AKU at an event uh, organized by CCIT, where one of the facilitators, again, he's here today, he challenged me. And he said, look, if you're looking for a solution, Mr. Rahman Ahmed, he said to me that you have to look at multiple right answers. And there's a key to this that goes beyond just the single right answer. There also has to be creativity. That's the magic spice. And so when I think about big data, I started thinking, am I being completely dismissive as a scientist and non-creative when those conspiracy theories get sent my way? And my clinical colleagues, when they get frustrated by the Google diagnosis, and rightly so, how do they harness the power of the patient who's coming to them? And that comes to the final C, which is collaboration. The only way we're going to conquer this disease, if we're ever going to find a cure for it, is if we work together, if we push ourselves out of our comfort zones. And again, a speaker has sp spoken about this, that Tash was talking about, pushing yourself out of your comfort zone. And being in a space where you can think creatively and critically and come together, and what I mean by coming together is not just the biologists and the scientists talking just to the clinicians. I mean talking to the economists and the sociologists and the historians and the anthropologists 
and for everyone to come together and realize that this disease is amongst us. And if we're going to conquer it, we have to collaborate. To create these public and private partnerships where we're able to educate the public, where we're able to take the issues of Pakistan into context, understand the most indigenous problems, and therefore come up with our own indigenous solutions. For the biologists to talk to uh, the, the engineers, to come up with ways to detect cancers faster and then to treat them better. All of this will only happen, and I'm going to challenge all of you to do it today, to push yourselves out of your comfort zone. When uh, Roman said to me, oh, you know, there's this ketogenic diet, I had this gut reaction to, oh my God, another fad diet, I don't want to hear about this. But it's true. We know that a diet that works for one person will not work for another because our microbiomes and, and the, our inherent biology and, and the uh, organisms that share our body are different for different human beings. And as a consequence of that, we respond differently. So it's not out of the realm of possibility. So I'm going to promise that I will push myself out of my comfort zone. And as I've done so, I want all of you to come join me in the journey and start thinking about what you have to contribute. Because it's more than likely that the person sitting next to you, if they have already not gotten it, is going to get cancer. And someone sitting in the row, in the same row as you, is going to die of it. So it's our responsibility. And how are we going to come together to solve it? Thank you very much. At this point, I'll ask you to put the music up a little bit. The music's been playing for a little while, and it's there to really make a point. Um, for those of you who know me, um, and some of you will recognize this, I recently started taking piano lessons. I've been pushing myself out of my comfort zone. So I've been listening to a lot of classical music. And the music aficionados amongst you will recognize this as Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. The opening segment, the first movement that played as I came out here was uh, very appropriately cast in C minor. Beethoven wrote it in the note of C minor. And what we're listening to now, if I can have the volume go up, is this triumph against odds, this climax, which he pitches in C major. And you can feel it move amongst you. And that's what I want all of us to do together if we're going to ever arrive at a cure for cancer. We're going to do it together, creatively and critically. Thank you very much.